Okay. Yeah, so um, welcome everyone to the 22nd lecture of the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series. Uh, since 2021, we've been in this journey of, of looking at um, themes and issues from different philosophical traditions. And uh, it's been quite uh, an interesting journey uh, with rich conversations uh, so far. I'm Dr. Elvis Imafido. I'm the director of the Center for Global and Comparative Philosophies, um, where the lecture is housed, the lecture series is housed, and also the convener of the BA World Philosophies program uh, at SOAS. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, with us uh, Professor Gina Fast, uh, who is the Professor of Applied Ethics and the Common Good at Hampshire College in Massachusetts. Um, I was drawn to uh, Gina's work when I saw the uh, book on decolonial existentialism and phenomenology, which is quite an interesting collection of uh, the thoughts, critical thoughts of um, uh, such interesting scholars as Louis Gordon, uh, Franz Fanon, Richard Wright, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and that that's a very uh, interesting book to look at when you're thinking of the phenomenological subject beyond the um, idea of the detached, the contextualized subject of the West, which is actually the Western subject, and, and looking at it from a more global perspective. So yeah, I do I do encourage you to look at that uh, that book. Um, uh, Gina's area areas of expertise or specialization is uh, feminist feminist epistemology, uh, critical philosophy of race, and generally conversations around um, philosophical marginalized philosophical perspectives. I would say uh, today, um, Gina will be speaking on the theme aesthetics and the ordinary notes of being in Marcus Winter and Sharp, and so um, Gina, you have our full attention. Um, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me um, and for having me today. I'm very excited to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a recent chapter that will be published in 2024 in a text that I'm editing. Um, the text is entitled Creolizing Marcuse, um, and it's through Roman and Littlefield International. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the series and how it has informed my work, um, as well as specifically the creolizing of Marcuse that I'm doing by reading his work together with Sylvia Winter's work, um, as well as Christina Sharp, who um, is an American theorist, philosopher, um, Black Studies professor, actually out of Toronto currently. So I'm going to share my screen. I have some, um, I have a lecture slide, but I will be mostly drawing from the chapter um, that, I, that will be published by the end of the year in the text. All right, so, um, Okay, so I'm gonna situate the project. My most recent work, um, as was noted, has focused on decolonizing and creolizing the so-called Western canon of philosophy. So I have focused previously on existentialism and phenomenology as methods um, and as presenting these detached methods from understanding the phenomenon of appearance to consciousness and the way in which this has been situated primarily um, through the construction of European man following Sylvia Winter. Uh, but still, I have some reservations about decolonization as a process and as a method in that following Drusilla Cornell, decolonization can still reinforce Eurocentricity, whiteness, and Western systems and figures. So there's a tension in my work, especially, you know, as I work with and through and um, the understandings of folks like Simone de Beauvoir, as well as Jean-Paul Sartre, and the critical theorists, especially from the early Frankfurt schools, such as Marcuse and Adorno and Horkheimer. Um, some other some other issues that we've seen in thinking about creolizing as a method has been that creolizing can romanticize mixing and resolution over justice. 
Um, and some of the, the essays actually in the collection are looking at, um, you know, Rastafarian epistemologies and the way in which the Jamaican government has used um, reggae as a means through which to creolize Jamaican national identity in this romanticized way where it's emptied of politics and of the meaning of the marginalized um, and instead favors mixing and resolution over justice. Um, as a feminist theorist, I really um, situate my work in considering how we can live and work with these tensions rather than seeking perfect or ultimate resolution. And this kind of spans my work. So it definitely enters into my philosophical scholarship um, and my transdisciplinary work, but also even in the work that I do in building um, open educational resources and women's and gender studies and thinking about feminist processes of review of contributions or submissions. You know, what would a feminist method um, for for what has been historically known as blind review look like? How would it look different than the way in which we we tend to understand submission to journals or to texts? And so before I get into my um, specific chapter, I wanna say a little bit about the project of creolizing the canon. I'm a member of the Caribbean Philosophical Association and um, about 15 years ago at this point, the CPA, in partnership with Roman and Littlefield, created an academic book series entitled Creolizing the Canon. Um, the series editors are Jane Anna Gordon um, from University of Connecticut and Neil Roberts from Williams College. Um, and what creolizing within this series does is it does three things generally. So the first is that creolizing the canon seeks to return to traditionally canonized figures through the lens of creolization. Um, so creolizing Marcuse and the work that I'm doing in this chapter engages in part in this. We're returning to a figure who has been canonized and who is experiencing actually in the United States quite a resurgence as we look at student activism um, in regard to um, Palestine in regard to considerations of the kind of neoconservative wave of policing the campus and the takeover of campuses like New College in Florida. Um, the second way that we think about creolizing the canon is through arguing for the canonizing of new figures. One example of this was, you know, Rosa Luxemburg is studied in political theory, but isn't really read together with Africana Caribbean, um, Africana and Caribbean scholars. So creolizing Rosa Luxemburg was very much geared towards this, toward canonizing Luxembourg um, within or reading um, her together with figures in Africana and Caribbean philosophy. And then finally, the third kind of deployment of creolization that is used within this series is pointed toward generating new scholarship that deploys a creolized method. And creolizing Marcuse and what I'm doing in this chapter um, focuses primarily in, on one and three. None of the texts are squarely or perfectly, you know, aligned with one of these goals. They tend to float in and out of or to engage in an, an engagement with one or more of these categories. Um, in Creolizing Marcuse of the Text, it's a collection of essays by 11 scholars from across the globe. Um, so, and there are some who are working in social and cultural geography, others are philosophers, um, others are sociologists, others are political theorists, um, and we are engaging in returning to Marcuse to generate new scholarship. Um, but again, a tension that exists in this broad project and in the process of creolizing canonical figures generally is the question of, are we in the end recentering white European man, man, <laughs> singular, and then men generally. But there are some benefits in creolizing Marcuse. For some writing in the collection, Marcuse already engages a creolized or creol creolizing methods without naming them as such. For others, it's Marcuse's commitment to concrete philosophy and the abolishing of oppression that make him an ideal figure for creolized engagement. Um, so Marcuse, something I actually just learned in working with Neil Roberts over the 
past couple weeks is that Marcuse and Winter actually work together um, toward the end of Marcuse's career. And there are several essays on aesthetics that have been rarely engaged um, within philosophy and political theory scholarship um, that we can look to to further think about the connections between Marcuse and Winter, especially. And so what I'm doing with this chapter is I'm rejecting the idea that there is one way to read Marcuse um, and that there is the way that the way to re read Marcuse is through coming to Marcuse through Hegel, Marx and Heidegger, i.e. the history of Western and German philosophy. In performing this, there is a, a mundaneness um, to this reality of multiple readings or multiple ways of coming to a scholar and to a body of work. And then there's the fact that this ends up being robustly generative. Um, following Gassant and the idea that the whole world, including human understanding theory and practice is already creolized or has always already undergone or is undergoing this process of creolization enables one to literally shift um, to, to shift literally and figuratively the geography of the reason. Realizing Marcuse, um, specifically in this chapter where I'm focusing on aesthetics, functions to consider the complexities of interrelated entanglements that produce culture, theory, and politics in the Caribbean and across the diaspora communities that are African, Latino, Latina, Latinx, etc and enables us to produce a better understanding of intricate um, divarications of community and culture. And so now I wanna get into the work itself um, and thinking about the way in which aesthetics is an important sphere um, of consideration and politics is not going to be the way forward for liberated consciousness alone for Marcuse, as well as for Winter and Sharp. So Jane Anna Gordon writes, as it, se as it stands, it seems as if what Creolization is doing is to invite other people into our home instead of going to their places of residence. Unless the dominant intellectual systems visit other systems as guests and understand their lived processes of knowledge creation and fit their ideas with those of the marginalized and those who are materially and intellectually dispossessed, a truly egalitarian creolization would not be possible. And so in this vein, I see creolization as pushing back or talking back or challenging um, the, the tendency to mine um, the theories of the global majority of the historically and contemporarily marginalized of African and Caribbean philosophers, of South American and Latin American philosophers and theorists and artists to take what is useful, to bring it back to the center and then dispose of, of the complexity of theory of practice and of pursuits for liberation and justice. And so Gordon's framing um, requires us to think about ourselves as guests um, and to invite, in this case, Africana and Black American scholars and Caribbean scholars into our homes, not to merely mine in a colonialist process, um, the resources of theory, but to engage in the lived processes of knowledge creation of historically and contemporary, contemporarily marginalized populations and peoples. Um, and then what starts my chapter is a quote from Glissant um, that states, for those whose history has been reduced by others to darkness and despair, the recovery of the near or distant past is imperative. To renew acquaintance with one's history, obscured or obliterated by others, is to fully is to relish fully the present, or for for the experience of the present stripped of its roots in time yields only hollow delights. This is a poetic endeavor. Um, so this this indicating or this pointing toward um, liberation as a poet endeavor um, brings me to the question of aesthetics and what aesthetics does, the purpose of a, the purpose and functions of aesthetics, um, and, and specifically the way in which 
without aesthetics and without an aesthetic moment, the qualitative shift in consciousness that Marcuse sees as necessary to liberation, um, to political liberation, um, how that plays into or how that is understood in his work as well as Winter and Sharps. So just briefly, um, I'm gonna go over who Marcuse, Winter and Sharp are um, just to give you some framing of these folks that I'm going to be reading together. Um, so Marcuse is a German philosopher of both refusal and liberation. Um, this was how Angela Y. Davis describes him. He was born amid political tension in Germany and eventually fled to the United States where he remained for the rest of his life. Um, he was a member of the Frankfurt School, um, a collective of critical theorists that formed the, that were associated with and formed then in the United States, the Institute for Social Research. Um, in many ways, Marcuse's life never escaped politics and place. Um, so in placing Marcuse is also important. His life was intertwined with social and geographic landscapes. Um, and he moved through um, these social and geographic landscapes with care. Um, in his intellectual pursuits as well. Uh, Sylvia Winter is a Jamaican anti-post-colonial philosopher, theorist, artist. Um, in fact, uh, Winter first described herself as a dancer and an actor and only later began to understand herself as a writer and a theorist. And while her work on the coloniality of reason is, is is, is well understood and well covered by scholars. Um, her aesthetics and her works um, on aesthetics tend to be, tend to be um, of less interest historically. That is growing. McKittrick has a, a really great text on um, winter that looks at not just epistemology, but also aesthetics in new and interesting ways. But basically, um, Winter theorizes for my purposes an anti-teleological -teleolog analysis of anti-colonialism, stitching together the ideas, histories, social relationships, and narratives of Blackness and colonialism that produce legibility in relation to one another. Um, and part of thinking about Winter's aesthetics also places in um, context her break with Marxism um, and with historical Marxism as a result of the failure of Marxism to theorize um, the history of racialized chattel enslavement um, in the Caribbean as well as in the United States um, and the failure generally of Marxist theory to theorize about race and um, specifically blackness and coloniality and colonialism. But um, McKittrick argues that through Winter's work, there is the opening of the possibility of a new science of human discourse, and included in this is aesthetics. And again, something that I just learned that I found quite interesting um, is that Winter and Marcuse worked together right before his retirement. Um, it is well known that Winter um, that Winter has worked with other critical theorists, such as Frederick Jameson, but the the extent to which you know her work collides with is informed by um, dialogue with her colleague Marcuse is less under well understood. But Neil Roberts is kind of working on this and generating ideas on this as well. Christina Sharp is an American philosopher, theorist, and Black studies professor who writes about the legacies of racialized chattel enslavement. Um, her two most recent books are Ordinary Notes and In the Wake, and they link memoir, Ordinary Notes more so than In the Wake. Um, in the Wake, it's really the first 15 to 20 pages where you see the, the utilizing of the personal in connection to considerations of the her analyses of the legacy of slavery um, and museums that are dedicated and monoliths that are dedicated to the remembrance of racialized chattel enslavement and disasters like the Middle Passage, the Atlantic slave trade and Jim Crow segregation. Um, but what she is concentrating on in these texts as we link them together is the failure of a hegemonic um, system of the imaginary and of imagination to imagine the fullness of blackness. 
Furthermore, she engages in what she names as the creation of a practice, um, beauty as method. And this is, this is centered in my chapter as well, what that means, what beauty as a method means, um, as not just a, a creation of artistic objects, but the creation of the poetic endeavors of life and liberation. And so, there are a couple of experiences this past year that made me turn explicitly toward aesthetics and questions about art. Um, so I, I, I question, you know, what we ought to do as scholars, as philosophers, as political theorists. Um, and, and so the grounding question for my work here and what I've been searching for in um, my work here and in other work is, would liberatory causes be better served by engaging in politics instead of art? Um, so should I, for example, as a philosopher, spend my time writing about political philosophy over concerns with aesthetics and aesthetic theory? Um, some examples from this past year that informed my considerations are, you know, I taught two classes in the spring. One was entitled Reproductive Justice. The other was entitled Philosophy of Beauty. Is Reproductive Justice the more important class I taught? Um, was Philosophy of Beauty a frivolous course to teach? Um, how do we justify concerns with aesthetics in, in worlds where, you know, liberation doesn't exist um, and where where politics are are the, the spaces and places of life and death struggles. Um, also in working with students this past semester and seeing um, really the past year and seeing their reactions to to art over theory, thinking about performances of like the Gaza monologues or if I must die. Um, the poem, um, thinking about their reactions to the art that has been produced amid the miserable conditions of reality and how that has been more moving in some regard than theory, than covering theory and history. Does that say something about the value of art and the value of the aesthetic endeavor? And then finally, and most kind of prescient to this chapter and this project of creolizing Marcuse is what can Mark, what can we read together when we see and position Marcuse with Winter and Sharp? And what can they tell us about this? What can they, what can they produce in terms of a, a, a moral imperative about, you know, aesthetics? In part, this is a false dichotomy. Um, for Marcuse, a political praxis of change and art are, are not the same. They cannot be reduced to one another because art produces language and representation as a precursor to a future praxis of liberation. This is from um, the aesthetic dimension, Marcuse's 1977 work um, entitled The Aesthetic Dimension Toward a Critique of Marxist Aesthetics. So this idea that it's either art or it's either aesthetics and art and aesthetics, uh, we, we, I might use them interchangeably, but they're not, aesthetics is much more um, kind of robust and more than just considerations of art, but um, art and questions of aesthetics or in the discipline, subdiscipline of aesthetics are not disconnected from liberation, but for Marcuse, um, create a context where in which there is the production of new language and representation that function as the foundation or the as a precursor to the future praxis of liberation. Um, so art for Marcuse cannot change the world, but, but it can contribute to changing the consciousness and drives of those who change the world. And artists give people, viewers, a new symbolic representation that bursts the old, giving rise to a new liberated manner of qualitative being. Um, and so what I'm doing in this chapter is I creolize Marcuse's aesthetics by staging connections between his critique of Marxist aesthetics in the aesthetic dimension um, with the works of Sylvia Winter and Christina Sharp. Winter notably initially understood herself as a dancer and actress, then a playwright, first translating Garcia Lorca's Yerma into Jamaican Creole, and only later as a novelist, philosopher, and theorist. 
Sharp throughout her works interweaves the personal, the political, and the theoretical into poignant Black beauty, developing in the process what Marcuse suggests is impossible, namely the convergence of artist and philosopher. Yet within a miserable reality, still capable of radical transformation, where joy lives beside, amid, and in the afterlife of abject harm, Marcuse, Winter, and Sharp are all committed to the value of art. Furthermore, reading them together allows one to view how poetic forms of being are made possible by engagement with a radical practice of imagining that breaks with the limiting effects of the reality and performance principles within colonialist and capitalist orders. Moreover, these three theorists are committed to the truth of art that aligns with a modernist rather than a postmodernist understanding of truth and knowledge. In the end, by creolizing Marcuse's aesthetics, I seek to extend connections between Marcuse's radical praxis and Africana and Caribbean thought, as well as challenge explicit and implicit arguments made by Marcuse in the aesthetic dimension. I seek to extend the connections between Marcuse's radical praxis and Africana and Caribbean thought, in part because dominant Marcusean scholars and readings have generally overlooked these intersections. Um, yet, as I will show, Marcuse, like Marx, has limitations or limits in that the Caribbean that the Caribbean left highlight in their creative theoretical work. And so there are two arguments that I've broad arguments that exist in the aesthetic dimension. Um, so the first, he argues against Marxist aesthetic theory, um, claiming that the substance of art what makes art able to be judged as beautiful and aesthetically valuable cannot be reduced to an analysis of class or any other social determinant. Rather, there is a trans historicity to beautiful art as mediation amid the permanent and eternal conflicts in the human condition and the relations between human beings and themselves, human beings and others, and human beings in nature. A socialist society may be able to change the destructive, oppressive, repressive, and humili humiliating form of conflict but conflict will continue to exist. For instance, as we see, as we will see in Winters and Sharp's work, the lived realities of making beautiful lives alongside anti-Blackness in the wake of chattel racialized enslavement in North America occurs despite the end of class stratification. In the wake, in the wake of racialized chattel enslavement and amid the grander scheme of European modernity. And even as human beings liberate themselves from empire, the ills of anti-Black racism and the hegemony of white European man, human beings will still suffer the death of loved ones, experience guiltless guilt, remain estranged from their self, themselves and others, and face the absurdity of the existential human condition of desiring a deep meaning that is human one can never access without ceasing to be. Marcuse's second major argument concerns the rupture between the artist and the people and the artist and the theorist. For Marcuse, the artist cannot be part of the people in that the people are dominated by the prevailing system of needs. For the people to align against the barbarism of the current reality principle, there must be a qualitative shift that the artist's words, representations, et cetera, may, may incite. But prior to this rupture, there is no place, Marcuse says, among the people which the writer can simply take up and which awaits him. Rather, the writer, the artist, must create this place via a process that may necessitate standing against the people. There is then a material and ideological discrepancy between the artist and writer and the people that for Marcuse should be made explicit rather than obscured. Yet this bifurcation appears within a Western framework that divorces mind from body, human from nature, and art from aesthetics of the everyday. In creolizing Marcuse, I take serious his analysis of the value of aesthetics in creating better livable worlds for human beings. Yet there are limitations to Marcuse's argument in that it tends toward epistemic imperialism and its dismissal of the potential of the aesthetic value of the everyday as aesthetically rich. Um, by contrast, I argue that creolized aesthetics begins with the phenomenological discernment that everyday existence, even in its most ordinary form or forms, contains extraordinary, it contains extraordinary value. Um, constructing livable worlds for human beings, especially for those who live in the wake of oppression, requires more than attention to politics and material determinants, such as access to basic necessities for biological survival, though it requires these too. The aesthetic dimension of human life is necessary for initiating a qualitative shift in the meaning of human life, as well as experiencing a qualitatively enriched existence. 
In this way and in others, I understand access to the aesthetic experience of the ordinary as extraordinary to be inexorably tied to existential and political liberation. Um, so for thinking back to that glissant quote, for people who have had their histories erased, part of the poetics of being, contributing to or functioning to produce a qualitative shift in consciousness requires a repetition of history to reclaim that which has been purposely misplaced. Um, and Marcuse is going to argue that repetition of reality is itself not um, an example of an aesthetic experience. And um, this is one of the, the kind of epistemic limitations that, that derive from um, imperialist hegemonic consciousness that exists in Marcuse's work. Um, but I do want to note that, that the purpose of this chapter and my work is not to criticize Marcuse. Um, a Marcusean practice very much entails, and Marcuse imagined, engagement with his work that didn't just engage or didn't just enact application, but really struggled with um, and amid his theoretical and um, practical components of theory. Um, so I don't see this so much as a criticism of Marcuse, although it is in a part, in part, but engagement with Marcuse and a, a, a taking up a Marcusean imperative that he himself suggested. Um, so Marcuse wrote about art and revolution throughout his oeuvre. His aesthetic theory is most notably expanded and clarified in his last book, The Aesthetic Dimension, from 1977. He envisions art here as succeeding as two-dimensional cultural criticism in a one-dimensional society. Unlike Hegel, who sees art as preceding full self-consciousness and ending as mere art when spirit becomes self-conscious or self-consciousness, and Marx, who neglects the radical and and political potential of this aesthetic dimension, Marcuse understands art rather than politics to be necessary to the development of radical self-consciousness and societal change. For Marcuse, art and the aesthetic theories that underlie judgments about art's purpose, purposes, and what is and what is not beautiful, objectively good art, can, et cetera, cannot be reduced to, anal to analyses of class-produced art or the class production of art. Marcuse writes, Marxist aesthetics presumes that all art is somehow conditioned by the relations of production, class position, and so on. Its first task, but only its first, is this, the specific analysis of this somehow, that is to say, of the limits and modes of this conditioning. The question as to whether there are qualities of art which transcend specific social conditions and how these qualities are related to the particular social conditions remains open. Marxist aesthetics has yet to ask, what are the qualities of art which transcend the specific social content and form that give art its universality? Um, so for Marcuse, even if class conflict was, re was resolved tomorrow, in terms of economic stratification and power, the pa paired entanglements of joy and despair, eros and thanatos would not dissipate. Suffering and the deep pleasures of human existence would still call for the, for the necessity of the oblique expression of art. And in fact, part of what a plasticized society seeks is to eliminate eros and the eroticism of everyday yet of everyday life. And yet, even as Marcuse questions how art transcends the specific specificity of time, he does not empty from art and aesthetic judgment its social and political meaning and power. To deny art such materiality would be absurd for a critical theorist. Nevertheless, nevertheless, to reduce art merely to class conditions discounts the history of art as having effects, meaning, and power as beautiful outside of its contingent political settings. Art from Arcusa can make visible the contradictions of the dominant society and look upon the world to indict specifically, think art made during and after Auschwitz or today amid the genocidal assault in Palestine. But this power is not confined to the present time in which the art is made. Art retains the content of contingent social and political situations, yet goes beyond them by appealing to humanity, a different way of being, a hope beyond the oppressive realities of a one-dimensional society. Notably here, Marcuse derives part of his aesthetic theory from the Kantian concept of disinterested judgment, the notion that beauty is accessed, is accessed without vested interest as a constant quality in ordinary perception that renders judgments of beauty subjective, partial, and fleeting. But as a critical theorist, Marcuse does not see judgments of beauty as universally valid in Kantian format, nor does he ascribe to an aesthetic formalism, the idea that all that matters for aesthetic judgments of beauty is a specific formal pattern, pattern, 
patterning of the interrelated parts of the object in time and space. Rather, Marcuse seems throughout his work from his dissertation to the aesthetic dim dimension to equate the quality of being, the quality of beauty with the quality of freedom. Um, but what this freedom is becomes problematized when we look, look at Winter and Sharp's work. Um, so the, while social determinants do not constitute the substance of art, social determinants may play a role in the style of the work, the language used, the artistic movement in which it's caught up, but not its substance or its quality. Um, Marcuse famously uses the example of Hamlet um, in, Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's most famous line, to be or not to be, um, and argues that this text and this line have a trans historicity that goes beyond the specific society in which Shakespeare lived. There is an objective truth in trans historical beauty that Hamlet, and again, this famous line, expresses about the lived condition of being human. Um, and Winter, and I'm going to, I use Winter and I use Sharp to problematize this idea of a trans historical objective truth to the beauty of a work of art. Um, and the idea of autonomy and the, the notion of preserving autonomy um, that occurs within the aesthetic dimension. Um, so for all, for all in Marcuse's argument that inspires appearance, the ideals of the intrinsic value of art and its potential and aesthetic value of liberatory, value as liberatory, there are two claims that he makes that I problematize. Um, first, Marcuse's suggestion that everyday art, i.e. that which is not fine art, is able is unable to rise to the level of philosophical and aesthetic significance is misguided, misguided and functions ultimately as a form of epistemic imperialism. Within anti-Black racist, white settler, settler colonial, heteropatriarchal systems, um, Black, Brown, and Indigenous people are devalued in their recognized capacities to reflect on themselves in theoretical, theoretically meaningful ways. Um, and this comes from Lewis Gordon. But if aesthetics is understood as that which is in, involved in the study of sensory and symbolic life, there seems to be no good reason to excuse from the aesthetic dimension all of the ways in which human beings make homes for themselves in a world that cannot give them meaning. As Lewis Gordon asserts, such, such mediations, such meditations should be brought to the fore as they represent the core of how human beings live in the world, not only in terms of making lives worth living, but also in the value of those living it. For both Winter and Sharp, making life worth living for Black people, Caribbean people, Afro-Caribbean people, and diasporic communities, this often requires a confrontation and a refusal of the hegemony of white European man. The character or practice this takes on will not be universal. It may look like a reclaiming and a remaking of indigeneity. This comes from Winter and in John Canoe in Jamaica, or it may reject the possibility of or see as suspect any conception of a return. And this comes from Sharp. But what is shared is a turn toward black life as a source of beautiful living. Second, Marcuse's claim that a work of art has a universal character and meaning that transcends time relies on the notion of a coherent audience that shares a gaze. Yet as Winter and Sharp show in their respective works, this coherent audience does not exist. Now this is not to suggest an alignment with postmodern conceptions that the subject does not therein exist, but rather to consider how the idea of a coherent audience deriving a specific understanding from a work of art relies on the myth of the universal of white European man itself. For Sharp, the case against Marcuse is concrete. Take Sharp's example of teaching elementary school students about Martin Luther King Jr. and the history of Jim Crow segregation in the United States. From the perspective of the assumed universal and all encompassing dominant white gaze, the lesson imagined to be imparted to the, by the institution is racism is bad, or look how far we have come. But in reality, as testified to by Sharp, herself and writers like Shaquille Heath, this is not the only note to take hold. It is just as possible for non-Black students to take these lessons within anti-Black worlds and use them to justify their own superiority and in their interactions with Black peers. Heath recalls that as the only Black student in her class, the white students would peek over the top of their books to look at her as they were learning about the history of racialized chattel enslavement and segregation of public and private life. Later, Heath used a water fountain a school water fountain and watched as a white girl using it after her, wiped the fountain with her sleeve before drinking herself. 
the white girl in this encounter did not derive the intended and expected universal lesson. Um, and so I, I go through several, several examples similar to this from Sharp's work. She has really powerful passages that look at Cower, Carol Walker's work, um, A subtle, Subtlety or the Marvelous Sugar Baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tasters from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino Sugar Refining Plant. And looking at Walker's work has, um, has, has been part of um, Sharp's work since her first book, Monstrous in Intimacies. Um, she also looks at the Justice and Peace Memorial in Alabama and the different um, kind of occupation of space or arrival in space that white versus black viewers enact. Um, she talks about the the kind of white hysteria of a woman she a white woman she encounters in this museum fate in this museum space and the way in which the white woman pushes um, her guilt onto sharp as an empty black figure she could have been any black person um, what this white woman wanted to do was just confess her guilt and she's preoccupied with the fact that within this museum that's dedicated to memorializing um, lynchings that occurred in the United States, she's worried about, Sharp is worried about finding the name of one of her loved ones memorialized and is disrupted in this violent way by the literal kind of vomiting of guilt by this white woman. And so this idea that there is a universal content or experience um, of art or of memorials um, is something that Sharp problematizes and that inevitably creates the space for um, rethinking Marcuse's analysis. Where are we on time? I feel like. Yeah, it's um, uh, just about, you've used about 40 minutes so you can you can okay. have some, yeah. So why don't I wrap up? That way we have time for discussion. Yes. Um, but so the the last section of this chapter looks at the concepts of black beautiful writing and the aesthetics of the everyday. And so I cover Winter's intellectual and political break with Marxism and the way in which through aesthetics, she begins to think about the dual and ambivalent role the Black subject finds themselves in in the Caribbean. Culture, she argues, becomes how Black subjects root themselves socially and environmentally. In several cases, this occurs through the creation of replicas of African social norms and practices, but in others, the results are creolized, or as Winter prefers, indigenized practices. Um, so to understand how creolized or indigenized processes function as rooting, we have to understand spatial division, specifically for winter of plantation and provisions grounds in the colonial world. And so this idea of the aesthetics of the everyday and the connection I draw between winter and sharp um, and a way to, to expand Marcuse's considerations of um, the aesthetic dimension occur through thinking of the everyday that occurs on provision ground and in the everyday living with specifically her mother um, for Christina Sharp and her recounting mm -hmm. of the creation of a beautiful black life in life with her mother, um, with her mother for Sharp. So for winter, provision ground was the place and space of the land where Africans cultivated being, culture, and sustenance, forging reconnections to the earth, one another, and themselves. The African presence, winter writes, rehumanized nature and helped to save his humanity against the constant onslaught of the plantation system by the creation of a folklore and folk culture. So while Marcuse dismisses folklore and folk culture as, as, as not the kind of art that could contain universal character or universal truth that is trans-historical, for winter, there's a value to folklore and folk culture that creates a context for the rehumanizing of nature, as well as the, the bringing back into semiotic space of Black peoples, of Caribbean and African peoples. Um, 
All right, so I'm going to close with an analysis of, or a little bit of an overview of Ordinary Notes, which is Christina Sharp's latest work. Um, so following, following Catherine McKittrick, um, Sharp is looking at the way in which there emerge contradictory understandings of art in the everyday that has an important ontological significant significance for black life um, in that it reveals black life is not a single static object of analysis a black concept a black body a black community a black idea that is poised to be accessed but rather it's a site or series of sites of sustained and or provisional world making activities that are invested in liberation um, and the second component that is important here is that sharp um, very clearly and explicitly um, shows that there isn't a singular art artist viewing or a singular way of viewing an artist's work that is possible or produced through aesthetic experience. All right, so in conclusion, um, I, I really see all three of these theorists as explicitly valuing art as socially and qualitatively as important as politics. Um, that said, Marcuse's theory requires supplementation to reach the radical potential he envisions it to contain. In the volume Creolizing Marcuse, this comes through as um, a repeated criticism, the, the kind of Western framework and framing of Marcuse his inattention to the global South when he speaks of colonialism. And in part, I in part in the introduction, we say this is understandable. You know, he's thinking about student movements, um, you know, against Vietnam. And so that's the example of the day that he's considering. But um, there's this absence, there, there are a few absences that exist in Marcuse's thought um, that creolizing Marcuse allows us to to draw out and create rich engagement and generative um, forms of thinking and thought. Um, but reading Marcuse's positive assessment of art as necessary in producing a qualitative shift in consciousness and his critique of Marxist aesthetics together with the creolized theories of Winter and Sharp offers a new way to think about creolizing Marcuse and the, necess the necessity of creolizing aesthetics generally. Um, and even though Marcuse's explicit arguments tend toward epistemic imperialism, as he dismisses the potential of the aesthetic value of the everyday ordinary experiences, acts of living that themselves represent the entwining of life and art as, as concomitant. Um, finally, liberated consciousness does not require the separation of politics and art within a creolized framing of aesthetics. Rather, they can arise stitched together um, as evidence of or examples for a qualitative shift in consciousness. All right, so I want to leave time for discussion and questions and comments. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, that, that was very uh, thought provoking. And I mean, yeah, it's it's very hard, particularly in, in, the, in um, sort of indigenous philosophies, to think of art as being separate from mm -hmm. uh, politics. You know, it's it's very much intertwined, um, and I think it's part of those essentialization that happens in academia where we want to bifurcate or dichotomize. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, that's very interesting um, thoughts. Um, so yeah, um, it's open for comments, uh, questions. Um, you can raise your digital hand or pop something in the um in the chat yeah uh yeah please let's have um pedro please go ahead hello good afternoon thank you for your talk and also for the organization of this this uh conference conference not a, a palestra in portuguese i don't know the translation so I'm working um, in philosophy of art, and uh, I'm working regarding the new artistic forms that developed from the 90s until now that have been called relational art, um, participatory art, community art, and artivism. And um, yeah. it looks like it, there is a, a disbelief in the aesthetic, on, contrary to what Marcus says, and uh, there is a, a belief in direct action, direct action that, that is indiscernible 
from other other um, activities, the, from the everyday, like organizing a dinner or uh, doing a, a public intervention in public space, questioning some situations, some some uh, some initiatives from government, etc., etc. Et so I would like to know if. Um, in the aesthetic dimension of Marcuse, do you think there can be any form of accommodating these forms of art? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and so I actually, in part of my chapter, I look at popular art and in the West and the way in which in, in really from the 60s, 70s onward, with the arising of popular art, you you, you see a, a shift, but Marcuse doesn't see this as art. He uses these examples and sees pop art and its aesthetic relatives and like political art and performance art as mimesis, as, as recreating history and not producing qualitative shifts. Um, and I, I actually think this is a failure of Marcuse. Um, and I, I think in part this is because, you know, Marcuse dies in the early 1980s as well. I think if he had been engaging kind of with the contemporary legacies of performance art, um, of feminist performance art, um, as an example, he would he would rethink this. But yeah, he he explicitly says that um, everyday folk art, political art, pop art, and their aesthetic relatives lack the cognitive and cutting power of the aesthetic form. They are mimesis without transformation. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think I think that's that's also another area for thinking about extending Marcuse's theory and sometimes reading Marcuse mm -hmm. against himself, right? Um, that 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 you know, unfortunately, we are limited and in, in our being, right? We die, and so so in his engagement with students and with politics, um, you know, would would that have changed over time? And maybe because the aesthetic dimension is, is published very late in his career. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward for the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, I don't want to like plug a book, you know, I, I feel, I feel kind of, that seems shameless, but I would encourage, um, you know, even just, we, we're going to put some of the chapters up on like academia.edu or .org. Um, and it's a really a great collection of, of young scholars to very established scholars who work in seven or more different languages and um, who are engaging with Marcuse in a way that Marcuse has historically not been engaged with. Um, and it's, it's really exciting. It's really exciting to emplace Marcuse in places like Haiti and Jamaica and Mexico, and to think about the the inviting of of scholars and thinkers from the global majority, from queer communities, um, feminist scholars into Marcuse's like home. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you again. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, before uh, perhaps someone has um, raises a question, I I just wanted your thoughts on on this as well, um, considering that. Art and, and and aesthetics itself is um, subjected to political interpretation. Um, yep. um, the, the power to interpret art and and what it is, what value it has, um, isn't art itself um, essentially uh, political or well, maybe I know I know putting it essentially um, a politicized phenomenology. I, I would say. Um, yeah, uh, just just your thoughts on it. Uh, I would say yeah. Yeah, so the, it's it's I th I think coming to aesthetics and really my interest this semester as well has been inspiring and encouraging these conversation with students. You know, is art just propaganda? Is art just politics in a new form? And those are things I I really grapple with as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I see in Marcuse is Marcuse that's his that's his central criticism of Marxist aesthetics, right? That art and the aesthetic dimension is more than just politics. Um, and Winter, I, I see Winter in her earlier works, like um, John Canoe in Jamaica as saying, no, like art is political, it's culturally in place. Um, it, that's political dimension can't be separated from the aesthetic dimension. But an essay that I'm currently reading and thinking a lot about is 
it is a less known essay and it's called Rethinking Aesthetics, Notes Toward a Deciphering Practice by Winter. And in this, um, which I think might've been published in 2012, um, John Canoe in Jamaica is from the seventies, um, but this, this relatively newer essay that hasn't had much scholarly engagement outside of maybe McKittrick um, she, she's making a similar argument to Marcuse, that there's something very specific about the aesthetic dimension that, that, it, that makes human beings human. Um, and so she divides like the human being in, in her later work into, you know, this genetic kind of biological species and then this like semiotic species. Mm. And she sees aesthetics as belonging to specifically like the creation of a human life. And it can't be reduced to merely politics, though politics is part of it. And so I think that question, Elvis, is, is really one that's at the center of my work as well, that I go back and forth because on in some regard for Marcuse, if it's just politics and there's no hope that when you when you bring aesthetics when you when you when you reduce aesthetics to politics then you flatten the autonomy of art and you create a context where in which there's no hope mm -hmm. um i see this as a, an overstatement um of of what's happening and i think the consequences that when you when you theorize aesthetics as as completely a apart from politics in this way of having this kind of autonomy, then it creates a context where the implicit and maybe even explicit implication, logical implication is that there cannot be an aesthetics of the everyday, right? And it reinforces this Western bifurcation of like reason and emotion and mm. human in nature. Mm. Um, but, but I'm super interested to, to spend more time with this essay by Winter because I, I see, see this, she's not necessarily going as far as Marcuse, but she, she's, she's doing something a little bit different than, than what she did in her earlier work, um, where she, she understands this like cultural specificity and this re-semanticizing -semantic of, um, of African and Caribbean and diasporic folks um, through art itself and through culture cultural practices of art yeah, yeah the really great question i have no concrete answer i can tell you what like mark Cousin and yeah. winter think in my reading but yeah i i'm kind of thinking that through and probably will be for the rest of my life yeah that, that's an interesting comment thank you gina sorry uh the 2012 winter essay is called what i get was it rethinking time? yeah rethinking aesthetics yeah. notes towards a deciphering practice and it's oh, really great. interesting it she she's arguing that one of the failures of cinema film critical theory has been that it's just repeated literary theory like the the practices of literary theory and she sees black radical film especially as doing something that requires a rethinking of the aesthetic theory and and film criticism um, and so she argues Used for what she calls deciphering as a practice and it's it's post deconstructionist it's it's super interesting yeah i'll check it out uh my dear colleague sean has a hand um thank you i'm so sorry not to put my camera on but there's a lot of uh, child and cat wrangling going on here um so thank you so much professor fast that was an absolutely fascinating um paper mm -hmm. and um I guess the question that I have, and it's it's really not a, a disingenuous one, I've really kind of understood what the project is that you're engaged in, but I was kind of thinking to myself, because it's the kind of question I also ask myself, is um, why is Marcuse so important here? Um, can't we just start with Winter and Sharp and still get to the same? Yeah, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a great question. I think, I think that is a certainly an important project in and of itself, right? Um, I see Marcuse as important to forging connections between theorists who who think about oppression and who have been very committed to, um, you know, theorizing about oppression and engaging in activism. Um, and so some of the ways in which historians Historically, you know, we can contrast Marcuse and Adorno and their, you know, their engagement with philosophy is lived. Um, so I absolutely think that you can get an answer to this question um, through looking at Winter and Sharp and reading them together as well. Um, why I'm interested in Marcuse as well is because I think Marcuse um, 
embodies an example of a figure who is also in place to also is engaged with the politics of the day and who is engaged as in like an open practice of philosophical theorizing practice and praxis. Um, and so I see I see his legacy as important to engage as well. And I see it less as an either or, but I, I don't think that there would be any kind of failure or problem in just starting with Winter and Sharp either. But I see Marcuse's theory and Marcuse's problems with Marxism um, as also helping us to understand some of the issues with Marxism that, you know, the Caribbean radical left um, introduced as well. And I see him as like an ally, so to speak, to use a problematized word, problematic word, an ally in that as well. Um, yeah, same. I, I feel the same. I think about that with Simone de Beauvoir as well. Um, so as Elvis noted, um, I theorize about Fanon and um, Richard Wright and Gordon and Sylvia Winter and Jam um, um, Jamaica Kincaid. You know, why even include Beauvoir in that? Um, and I think I think including folks who are who are decolonial philosophers um, and who are, have these shifts through engagement become important for thinking about the, the decolonizing of white consciousness as well. And so I see Marcuse as someone who sees himself as really radical and who still has these limitations, who has these epistemic um, imperialist um, frameworks in which he is he's seeking to deconstruct or move beyond but are but are still operating in these in these these really um insidious ways and so i think that also tells us something about the legacy of like white european man and the hegemony of reason by looking at marcuse as well oh, thank you that's that's really fantastically helpful i mean i i think i i really do agree and i can see the purpose of that um exercise i guess the thing that can that would worry me in the kind of work that I do, which is also using a lot of the work of Winter, Sharp and um, Hartman and so on. Yeah. Um, is, aren't we using them to rescue the white European man from Definitely. their mistakes and their kind yeah. of continuing investment in, you know, white colonialism, white settler colonialism, uh, racism, white supremacy, so on and so forth. Definitely, definitely. And that's following like Drusilla Cornell. I think that's one of the worries of decolonization and creolizing as method as practice as well. And I think as a feminist theorist, what what I do is I try to hold that tension. You know, what what is it to to live amid that tension then as well? Um, and to to realize that the project of of you know decolonizing of creolizing is always going to bump up against that as well. And what do we do amid that? Um, but I I don't find and I think there's there's a couple different ways right for scholars for for Sharp I think about how Sharp writes about and as an as has an interview said that all of her work is collaborative right like she has this intellectual circle of like black academics and artists um, whom she is always in process of of conversation and working and writing and reading one another. One second. Um, and so the idea that Sharp needs to read Marcuse to, you know, make an argument or to theorize would be, yeah, this is my daughter. It's summer. It's summer break. So she's a <laughs> little little girl. I've got my son here as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's all fine. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think I I think that your point, Sean, right, um, is, is is spot on as well. And I, I don't think. I don't think Marcuse is necessary. Marcuse is necessary, but I still find, you know, rich and generative ideas and engagement through thinking theorists together and through the processes of creolizing. But I would never begrudge or I would never, um, you know, do the things that happen at some conferences that won't be named in philosophy in the United States where, you know, the question is, well, have you read the original German? Have you, you know, have you traced sharp through the history of, you know, 
French existentialism. That that I think is 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 the legacy of that in practice, right? That when we when we engage with Marcuse in this creolizing function and fashion, that are we inviting then and requiring that scholars that you know engage in this refusal of you know engaging with the white Western canon? Are we saying that there's something lacking in that? Um, and so, so I think I think that's something also to think about the the implications of that. And it, it's it's it, there are things that I think about and that I try to hold tension. I hold try to hold this tension in practice. Um, yeah. Sorry. Now I'm rambling. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. that answer. And yeah. it's me to think about. Really. Thank you so so much. Wonderful. Thank Mark. you. Right yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's very interesting. I, I I definitely would love to explore a bit more your. Uh, what you said in your in your talk about the sort of interaction between uh, Marcus and Winter, um, yeah, yeah. Let's see how that that happened. Um, Alex, thank thanks for your patience. Please go on. Yeah. Hi everyone. Just um, uh, to Gina. Just thank you. It was such a rich engagement and paper, and I'm looking forward to meeting reading more of your work. Um. And just the way that you brought Winter and Sharp together was so wonderful. It's lovely to um, see them in dialogue with one another. Um, I was just wondering if you could share more of your thought about beauty, because if I hear, if I've heard you well, it sounds like beauty involves an affirmation of the everyday to create a more livable life amidst unutterably difficult conditions. And as a, as a moment of mimesis with transformation, um but yes more if, if you could share more of your thoughts i'd be delighted absolutely absolutely so um i really i what i did in philosophy of beauty which really kind of in engaged you know how i wanted to think about this process of creolizing marcuse and thinking winter and sharp together with marcuse um is that i really i i Throughout the course, we covered the the history of Western philosophy by reading together Western philosophers with um, contemporary feminist philosophers, queer philosophers, Black philosophers, African and Caribbean philosophers, and and we we really started to see the impact of of Enlightenment reasoning on the field of aesthetics and on conscriptions or constructions of beauty, and the way. That that I think of beauty is, is very much akin to the way that Sharp describes beauty. Um, beauty as a method and beauty as a practice and very much connected to the everyday and how we engage in the creation of expressive culture to make lives that are worth living. And I see this as very much connected to, um, you know, indigenous practices of, of ancestor veneration and, and you know, the, the living of life with our families. And so Ordinary Notes as this ode to Sharp's mother um, gives a gives a great overview of how I think of beauty as well. But Sharp, you know, Sharp puts together this um, like black miscellanea form in Ordinary Notes as well that allows me to see like even how I conceived of beauty in a way that is is more robust and is is much more beautiful than I can conceive of it. So what I would say is that um, for Sharp, you'll see these moments with her mother and the attention and the care. I think of beauty as also care. Um, so the way to live a beautiful life is married is very much to be engaged in this 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 practice of care, um, whether it is for our children or our partners or for, you know, what we owe to the land or what we owe to one another. Um, and so so in the future, I also want to think a lot about like aesthetics and ethics together in this idea of care and what it looks like to make beautiful lives through a praxis of care. Mm. Thank you, Jenna. Thank um, you. Um, uh, hi, Stephanie. Would you like to go ahead here? Hello. Um, love this. And as somebody who kind of really um, has bought into the idea of popular culture as a potential site for theorizing, humanizing, even philosophy, maybe, mm -hmm. um, I am really interested in how one engages with poli uh, popular culture in these kinds of conversations. Because you see, of course, I'm tempted to kind of 
make the most of what it means for people or to kind of maybe even play up what it means to people. But then the difficulty is in, you know, the fact that it is it is popular, yeah. it necessarily means multiple things to multiple people. Okay. And so how does one kind of avoid projecting their own kind of political project onto the popular forms of culture or the everyday forms of aesthetics? Yeah. And But then also see what they do mean to people. You know, how do you kind of, yes, use yourself, but then not impose yourself on the forms of culture, basically, if you have any insights from your own kind of experiences or the theorists that you're interested in. Definitely, definitely. And I feel like I'm just like plugging this this article by Winter because I was unaware of it until a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, the, the article that Elvis asked about the rethinking aesthetics notes toward a deciphering practice. Um, Winter explicitly engages with like pop culture of the day. So she references like Spike Lee, she's thinking about black radical film and in their space. And so instead of like deconstructing the meaning and trying to like pull out the intention of the artist or what the idea of a universal audience might derive from it. Um, she's, she's really thinking about deciphering as a practice where in which we we understand the rootedness of culture but we also are trying to understand kind of the 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 message and methods of of humanness that are at work there as well one second but yeah i would absolutely recommend this essay and then i think pop culture is a great place to mine for philosophy in part because it there is a there's like an efficacious reason as well. Teaching popular culture in philosophy classes tends to, at least in the United States where students aren't exposed to philosophy until university, it tends to be very rich. So I teach a class called Gender Self-Representation in Popular Culture. And, you know, we, we are able to do really great work by bringing in the, the popular cultural artifacts of students and then expanding what counts as popular culture. They kind of start with like, oh, reality television, euphoria. And then suddenly they're bringing in, you know, like all, all these examples that the other folks in the class don't know about, but we're able to like stitch together these analyses that are really engaging. And we can, you know, use Marcuse and Winter and Sharp to think through, you know, these artifacts, these objects, these ways of be being in the aesthetic dimension through using these pop culture, you know, references in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. I love that, I love that. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, those are very interesting conversations, I must say. And um, I, I think now we'll, we'll, we'll let you be and <laughs> and enjoy some time with your beautiful daughter. Um, and thank you all so much for your interesting comments and questions and for engaging so much with uh, this. This is a very interesting and lively thing uh, that we've had the pleasure of listening to this evening. It brings a lot of thoughts, uh, a lot of things to grapple with in different contexts. And I have a lot of questions now to think about within the context of African philosophy. So yeah, uh, thank you so much, Gina. Uh, that was very, very interesting. Uh, I wish you all a beautiful weekend and a beautiful summer, wherever you are. Um, our next lecture will be in September, something on Islamic philosophy, and I will uh, send a poster in early September. So have a lovely weekend, uh, enjoy the, the holidays, and, and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for having Thank me. You. Bye, all. Bye, Jenna.